Does someone ask for a Wheel of Time promotional stills? How about this? But now, how about another one? Another one. Another one. Hi everyone, welcome back to the channel. Now, I hope you've all had time to calm down from this Wednesday's reveal and had time to relax. Now, I was on the Dusty Reel with a few other guests where we broke down all four of these entertainment weekly promotional stills. And that was for three hours. Now, I haven't made my own video on it, so that's what we're going to be doing today. So let's jump right into that first image that we conveniently named the Fantastic Seven of the whole group. Now, before going into any detailed and intricate breakdown of these seven costumes, I just have to say, doesn't it look bloody fantastic to see this whole crew now in a photo, in costume, and see them, seeing them all together for the first time? It's something I know we've all been waiting for for at least two years now. And for a lot of you, the entirety of my life <laughs> as well. So yeah, a fantastic day to say the least. Right, so let's now jump in and do a bit more of a detailed breakdown of this photo. So the first thing that struck me about this photo was how each of these carefully considered and designed and crafted outfits for each individual perfectly encapsulates, you know, their status in the world and kind of their occupation. We've got Perrin, who's looking like he's wearing a blacksmith's outfit. We've got Lannan Moraine in her Eris Sedai and Warder outfits, respectively. We've got Matt, who looks like he's lived in these clothes for about 200 years and he's just walked right out of bed. We've got Rand, who looks like a shepherd with some kind of um, shielding coat. Then we've got Egreen with what looks to be a little bit more of a um, more richer material for her clothing, you know, showing her status as the mayor's daughter. And then finally we have Nynaeve who is wearing what could potentially be some sort of wisdom outfit, I suppose you could say. So after seeing that, I wanted to obviously go into a bit more detail about each uh, outfit. So that's what I'm going to do now. And I think I'm going to start off with both Lan and Moraine, but first Moraine. So let's jump right into a more detailed look at her costume. So if we zoom in on it, the first thing that strikes you is that huge ring on her left finger. Now that's obviously going to be her great serpent ring. Now, when we first got uh, photos of these images, it was very hard to make out, you know, what sort of design they'd gone with, and that still is the case. But with these higher resolution photos, we can clearly see that there's a stone, from what I can tell, in the middle, and it's coloured blue. Now, obviously, the first thought I had was, this is an interesting way of going about the Great Serpent Ring. Not only does it stand out, on screen and when you know the characters interact with uh, Maureen and just passes by they all know she's an heiress to die just from the ring but there's also an interesting mar marketing aspect from it so Maureen's got a blue ring and she's from the blue azure so there's going to be a running theme of each azure having the what's the word I'm looking for here corresponding color uh, stone in their rings and that's where the marketing aspect comes in. They're going to be able to produce, you know, all the edges, coloured rings for the women to go out and buy in the shops. And, you know, whatever adger they relate to, they can go and buy that coloured ring. Now, another thing that struck me straight away with Maureen's outfit is, I don't know if you guys would be able to remember this, but Say a year or so ago, there was a leaked image of um, Rosamund Pike in what we presumed was one of her costumes as Moraine. And what's really striking and made me remember that was the fact that on this photo, you can see like these shoulder pads, I suppose, or I suppose that's what you want to call them, the shoulder pads. 
Now, if I bring up that leaked image of Mo uh, Rosamund in costume, where we get a bigger understanding of what she's wearing underneath, as with, you know, for the most part, the costume is very much so hidden by, you know, her outer garment. It's a very similar costume, so I wouldn't be surprised if these two images are of the same costume. Now, yes, there are a few issues I'm sure we all have, and I have those as well with it, and that's obviously the lack of a quisiera. Now, that's something I'm hoping we do see going into this season, as I feel when we've read the books and think about what we envisage with Moraine and how she will look is that very item and so not having that there is a bit of a a bit of a bummer a bit of a letdown but I'm hoping you know that will at least play its part in some form or shape in the show. So up next is Lan's Warder's outfit. Now, what I love about this is how distinctive a look it is. And so I assume this is the kind of look and feel that we will see across the show for each warder's outfit. Now, a few things that struck me straight off was for first of all, how his heaven mark sword is on the back on his back. Now I know a lot of people didn't necessarily like this, but if you think of this from a practical standpoint, and now I'm no blade master or uh, swordsman, but I have taken fencing lessons. I know it's kind of different, but still hear me out. So he's got a cloak on, right? What happens when you get your sword, you know, on your side here and you try to take it out? It's going to get stuck and it's in the way. And when you're a warder, you need to be quick. You need to know the danger around you, be alert, and to kill it. So having the sword, you know, behind his back is a much more uh, convenient and appropriate place to have it. It's a quick, you know, movement. The sword is out right in front of you. And then you can, you know, parry and strike at your opponent with a much greater ease than having to have it come from your waist bring it up here, it might get stuck in between, you know, whatever you might be wearing and other objects in and around your uh, vicinity. So I feel that's why they've gone and, you know, moved Lan's sword to now on his back. I also love the fact that he's wearing gloves. I think that's a, a pretty uh, cool addition. Now, I can't really remember if there's ever a description of Lan wearing gloves in any of the uh, books, but I think... Just if you can imagine for one minute, you know, a warder or Lan without gloves and you're just wearing, not wearing, you don't wear your hands now, do you? But he just had his hands on display. I feel it wouldn't have looked as uh, epic as it does now with the, um, with the gloves. And then obviously the notable thing that I'm sure we can all see is the colour shifting cloak is not a thing. Now, we already knew this was to be the case because of um, financial constraints, if you want to call it that. And because, you know, they've got to pick and choose what they deem to be really uh, important for the show. And so I'm, I'm a little bit on the fence, but I know where they're coming from and it's understandable. So it's not too big of a deal for me. You know, a warder's colour shifting cloak doesn't make or break them. And so... You know, it's not too big of a deal for myself personally. Next, let's briefly go over the Emmons Field 5 now. Well, first of all, as I said, we've got Matt over here looking like he's just woke up and got out of bed in his outfit that he's been wearing maybe for a couple of days. Uh, that was my initial impression. You know, scruffy curly hair, disheveled beard doesn't look, you know, too groomed. I kind of like that about, you know, this iteration of Matt. It's an interesting route that they're going to be going down. Now, someone quite interestingly pointed out, I believe it was during the Dusty Real live stream, how he has a look of a much poorer person than, you know, any of the other characters on this uh, image. 
And that was quite an interesting observation to have and wasn't one that I had at all. And so it's interesting to see where they go with that in the story, if at all that is, you know, um, if it is, um, what is the word I'm looking for here, brought up on in the story. Moving on, the complete opposite of that, we've got a green right next to uh, Moraine. And out of the Emmonsfield Five, a green's clothing is of the highest quality out of all of them. And I would say that is pretty much because of her um, father being the mayor of Emmonsfield. And so it's just a way of portraying to the viewers that she's from a much more I don't know if you want to call it wealthy background. They have a bit more money behind them to afford, you know, finer silk or finer cloth to create their clothes with. Next to Egwene, we have big man Marcus Rudder. I don't want to hear nobody saying this guy is not big enough for Perrin. That's dead in the pan. Kill that. Um, once again, it's an outfit I like, the design choice. It looks like he's wearing a um, blacksmith's outfit, especially his top. It seems kind of very similar to what blacksmiths would wear, you know, as overalls. So that's really a nice touch. And it gives you an understanding of his profession when we first meet him. Then, of course, we've got Rand right next to him. The shepherd of the group. Now, I love this outfit. I especially love his coat. And what's the one thing we all know Rand kind of has a thing for? It's his coats, right? And so it's only fair he had this big sweeping coat that goes, you know, right down to near his ankles. I think that's so appropriate of what we know Rand for, at least early on. When he gets a bit, you know, older, a bit more further into the story, he takes a much more formal coat with, you know, a nice collar. But that is Rand, through and through. Um, he basically looks like a shepherd, and I think that's a great place to start him from. Also, to note, you can see uh, Tam's heaven mark sword on his uh, side, and he's also wearing what looks to be some sort of interesting, you know, leather piece on top of his uh, trousers. Um, I know that was mentioned in the live stream when someone mentioned what it was called but I've forgotten off the top of my head so I'm not even going to bother trying to look it up. And then finally we have Nynaeve. Now I have got to say when I saw this picture I was like Zoe is just killing it. She just looks like she doesn't like anyone. Just look at her. I could just see her you know tugging that braid of hers. She just looks pissed, and I think, you know, that's a fantastic look that Zoe, you know, chose for this particular photo, and I love that about it. But yeah, as a whole, to sum up this photo, I think it's a fantastic photo, and it pretty much encompasses what each an individual character is all about. Right, so let's move on to the next photo. And that is of Loghain's capture. And it has Alvaro Morte as Loghain. We also have Priyanka Bose as Alana Musfani. And Claire Perkins as Karine Nagashi. Now, what can we say about this photo? Well, for one, I love it. I love how Loghain looks still absolutely fierce even though he's captured and he also looks a little bit crazy as well and I think that's the perfect you know mixture that we want to see Logan looking like even though he's caged in like an animal. Um, another interesting thing to note is he also has what looks to be a dragon um, design on his collar which I find quite interesting and to me that obviously signifies that he Proclaimed himself as the Dragon Reborn. Now, something else I thought about this design choice with the clothing is... I kind of saw it as... He's kind of come into this position of potential power. We don't particularly know whether he is 
got a huge amount of power. It's something we'll have to see on the show. But it looks like he's almost taken these clothes from maybe a lord and then got someone to, you know, stitch in this dragon design on it. That's what the, you know, the initial impression I got. I don't know why, but that's how I saw it. I felt like he'd almost stolen these clothes to give himself that look of um, nobility, even though he doesn't have it. We can't, we can't also not mention the fact he's wearing a really dark black ring. I think that's a pretty cool, neat look. If, if there's anything, you know, with that, I don't really know. Um, next, we can see, obviously, this huge cage is in a carriage. Now, this carriage is purpose-built solely for the transportation of a prisoner, and in, this, and in this case, a male channeler that is being captured and is being shielded by their two Eris Sedai behind them, as well as probably the other members of the party that we can't see, which are off screen. And that's one thing I do love about this photo is what we can't see, but we know is going on within the image. We know he's being shielded. But what I love, especially about the Era Sedai in there, look at them. They look so calm. Look at um, Priyanka Bose, who I have to say looks fantastic as an Era Sedai. She looks amazing. She has this, you know, cool, serene face like absolutely nothing is going on in the world. But we know that there is a lot going on here that we cannot see. And I love that about it. Also, we didn't really mention this on the Dusty Reel, but it was in my head, but I never bloody said it at the time. Having uh, Claire Perkins here as Kareem Nagashi, Nagashi pretty much sums up where we are in the story in terms of where she is. It's not a flashback to uh, New Spring. She's here in the present. And that's very intriguing. And so we're going to have to see how they've you know played around and moved her story to fit in into present times because that's a considerable time jump between new spring and the eye of the world and then just staying on both of these green eras today and this is something i mentioned in the the dusty real live stream is we know them as the battle adra and so i felt with this almost sort of object on her wrists it almost looks like a piece of armor and so i wouldn't be surprised if as i mentioned these eris Sedai of the green adja are going to you know have stuff designed for them that signifies them as the battle adja and so i wouldn't be surprised to have armor pieces throughout the vital points of the body yes we know they can use the one power to shield themselves but perhaps they're in close close quarters combat they're not just going to take low gain and he's going to be on his own. There's going to be lo loads of followers of his right next to him with swords. And you're never going to be able to see every single uh, person right in your vicinity. And I feel that's why they're wearing uh, pieces of armour. Because they're going to be the ones that go head in first into the battle to get low gain. And then the rest of the other um, adjurs will follow. I think that's a really interesting design choice and one that I was quite happy to see. And then next we have obviously the two red sisters on ho horses in the background. Um, yeah, like I said about the first picture, you can tell straight away that they're all ever Sedai and we can tell that what adjure they're from, from the colours of their outfits. And I like that. And one final thing on, you know, the armour sort of thing. Corrine looks like she's wearing armour and potentially a sort of breastplate over herself here. So that's another interesting point. And obviously we can't overlook the fact that this is not in Cameroon. It's on the road to there. And so that's something we haven't seen. And so it's another interesting plot point to see what happens. And now one other interesting piece of information you may not know. If we were to go into the image section and go to properties and then details, there's a lot of metadata for these photos. And so I'll read that out for you now. 
So this photo, it says Caroline Plains, a green and perrin see wagon tracks heading east and then says friend or foe. So it looks like this is the path that a green and perrin are taking as well. And so there might be a convergence of the two groups at some point. So that might be interesting. I actually did kind of feel like this photo had the look of if you remember, there was a leaked set of where a green and Perrin camped overnight. I kind of felt like it looked to be in the same vicinity. So that's something to look out for in the episode. You know, whether these two um, particular groups do meet at some point. And just one final point I want to make about this photo is I love the attention to detail on everything. I mean, the wagon itself has these designs you know across the cage for example um it, you know these kind of circles or kind of ancient symbols i love that and it just adds to the world you know if this cage didn't have that it wouldn't look like it's a real world to me you know just every little attention to detail that they've put into this design and sets and props, this helps to add realism to the world that we're going to see in November. And so I'm you know, really happy that they've put so much attention to detail in the minutest of things. You know, we take for granted how important these small details are to making the world seem real. And that's a fantastic thing to see. Next, let's take a look at the photo of Rand and the Green. Now, this is a very simple photo, but it's one that is impactful in what the uh, photographer has done with it. Now, obviously, this is a very simplistic looking photo, especially out of the four we've got. It's the most, it's the most simple one, but it's also one of the more impactful ones. Now, what's happened here is they've blurred out the background of what I presume is and can only be the mountains of mist. And so what that's done as us as viewers is we have to focus in on the two characters. So we've got both Rand and the Green here. Rand's looking at a Green in a very, you know, fun and loving manner. But there's also a hint of a smirk about her. Like he's, he knows what a Green is going to do. While a Green, on the other hand, has this look of contemplation and maybe a look of her thinking back to all that's happened to them up until this point. That could be one point of view, or this could be before winter night, and maybe we'll have some scenes that we perhaps hadn't seen in the books that they've written specifically for the show, you know, to help bond the characters. And that's that could potentially be what this photo is from. I could be wrong on that, but it's just an idea that's popped into my head. Now, on the Dusty Reel, I did mention how I felt a green looked like she was looking back on what's happened to her, as in winter night, meeting Moraine, finding out she has the spark that she can channel, and thinking about, you know, how her life is going to change. And it's the same for every single member of the, you know, the gang that leaves with them from Ellen's Field. She knows none of them are going to be the same again. They're all going to change in dramatic manners. And she's kind of just thinking about that in maybe a sad contemplating um, point of view. But also looking forward and thinking, I'm going to be an Erisidae. I'm going to join the White Tower. I'm going to become an accepted. I'm going to become a full, mem full blood Erisidae. Uh, she's got that steely determination as well. But just overall, a beautiful shot, a beautifully simplistic shot that has a lot of emotion behind it and a lot of ways in which you can interpret it. Now, finally, we have the final shot, and that is, of course, of Shadar Lagoff. Now, I'm sure for any of you... Um, Subscribers and viewers of my channel on a recent videos, you know I love Shadar Lagoff. 
it's probably my favourite portion of the Eye of the World. It's what I suppose was the standout moment in the first book on my first read through. It's the bit that really got me hooked into the uh, series as a whole. The imagery that was going through my head when I was a younger, uh, young young man was so powerful. I can remember reading that passage in my room and I was there. I was in Shadow the Goth with the group. And so this is an important, important scene for me personally. And so hearing the fact from Rafe within this article with EW that they designed and built a set just for 15 minutes of uh, time on the screen is amazing to me. I love that fact. And I have to say, they've nailed the feel of Shadow the Goth spot on to me. Now, I know it's just a still and we have to see it in action and see how it looks on screen. But I am convinced this is going to be an amazing and memorable moment from the first season. I love this because, you know, Lan is carrying Moraine from doing all the channeling before they entered Shadow of Goth, keeping all the Trollocs that are on their tails from getting to them. And we've got Lan looking up at what I presume to be the moonlight and it's casting, you know, light across these huge towering um, buildings all over them. And I love that about this image. And also one other interesting thing to note is these doors here are from the church that was being filmed at in, I cannot remember the name of the city and I would butcher it anyway on trying it. But this is something that Sarah from uh, What Series pointed out on Twitter and that was a great find from her. But yeah, overall, I love this image. I love the fact that they designed the set and they've got a statue. That's literally one of the first things that Robert Jordan describes about Shadow the Goth in that first uh, chapter, Shadows Waiting in the Eye of the World. As he mentions, you know, outside of every building, there's either a statue or a fountain or, you know, spires. And so I love that, you know, they decided for this shot and for Shadow the Goth itself, the set, to have this statue there. It's quite a prominent looking statue as well. Uh, I also cannot not mention that we have Mandarb and Aldeeb here as well. Another great looking addition that we knew there would be there. So yeah, that's really nice. Um, yeah, once again, it's just the realism and the fact that they've taken the time and care to build sets like these, knowing how important they are not just for now, but for later seasons, as we're all too well aware of what happens here. And so I'm just so excited to see this on screen. That's going to be one of my favourite moments, without a doubt, from the series. So yeah, can't, look, can't wait to see it. But yeah, um, I believe that's going to wrap the video up now. Thanks for watching. I hope you stuck around. It's been probably one of my longest videos today, but there was a lot I wanted to say about each individual photo. Um, leave any comments that you have about all the photos, uh, likes as well. If you enjoy the video, it greatly helps the channel and to push the searchability of this video and channel on YouTube. So yeah, thanks for watching. I'll see you guys all in the next video.